there's a lot more to especially symptom burden and overall disease state than just what your blood counts are, what treatments you're on, but it's you as a whole person that really makes the difference in, in your disease and in how you live, what your priorities are, if it's family, if it's going to work, how long you're gonna live, and we know that even quality of life is important for overall survival in the myeloproliferative neoplasms. So I'm gonna talk in a little bit about unmet needs and kind of where, what the background was and why we started to look at non-pharmacologic therapies. We'll talk about some of the interventional trials that we have going on and then ways that you can connect with us to hopefully get plugged into some of these trials. So when we look at treatment in the myeloproliferative neoplasms, we know that there's a lot of unmet needs, especially in terms of symptom burden, but even to the point where some of our traditional therapies that we use, patients actually feel worse on them. Um, this is one analysis we did for polycythemia vera, and we saw that patients using hydroxyurea actually tended to feel worse than those who weren't. Now, is it effective the hydroxyurea? Well, you know, we can't really say that from this analysis, but what we can say is that there's definitely needs to treat symptoms above and beyond what a lot of our traditional therapies can offer. When we look at the myeloproliferative neoplasms, we actually have seen that inflammation is a large part of the disease course. You might say, well, Robin, what is inflammation? It basically is a stress reaction from the blood cells that happens when some sort of trauma, injury happens. And over time, that can actually lead to scarring of the bone marrow, as well as to a lot of the symptoms that we experience. And overall, we're seeing that with inflammation, symptoms can get worse. Some NPN patients actually have nutritional problems. They can have low blood counts actually as a result of that inflammation. They can have blood clots as a result of it. And overall, people's organs don't work quite as well. We also know that some of the more effective therapies that we have actually end up controlling inflammation as part of the way that they work. Aspirin's actually a potent anti-inflammatory. Um, Interferon, even though in some regards it actually can cause some inflammation, it also can help regulate inter inflammation. And ruxolitinib, Jacafi, actually was originally an anti-inflammatory drug being used for rheumatoid arthritis before they brought it into the field of myeloproliferative neoplasms. So this really gave us a context of, well, how do we impact symptom burden above and beyond these traditional therapies? Well, let's look into some of the other literature and see, well, A, what patients are doing to feel better themselves, but also what other tr non-traditional treatments could people do and possibly pair with traditional treatments to try to feel better and that have been shown to impact inflammation. One of the first studies we did, and, and Dr. Messam mentioned this earlier, is that we did a, a large study. Um, it was around 1,800 MPN patients. Um, it was an online survey, international, where we asked patients what they were doing to help control fatigue and a lot about different contributors to fatigue. If any of you did this survey, I apologize right here and now. It was a very long survey, but that's really because there's a lot of different things that can contribute to fatigue. When asking patients kind of what they did that was above and beyond traditional therapies, we saw that with pretty high frequency, patients were trying to set priorities, that if they were only able to do one thing in the day, they would make sure that that one thing was something that was very important to them. They tried to postpone non-essential activities. They tried exercise, naps, walking, socialization, uh, nutrition, reading, scheduling um, things during times of peak energy, pacing activities, structuring daily routines, delegation of tasks, music, gardening, relaxation, yoga, meditation, labor saving devices, going to church, new activities, volunteer activities, support groups, and even sleep therapy. One of the things that really stood out, actually, and, and when we looked overall, is that patients who exercised, actually, you know, chicken or the egg, patients who exercised had w less fatigue. And this, in part, led to an investigation of, into yoga. So the first investigation we did was just a small group. It was around 38 people. They had a 12-week online yoga course that was very unique. It actually, 
the person who put together the yoga course actually did yoga poses that so people perhaps with myelofibrosis who had a really large spleen that this yoga exercise wouldn't be impactful or negatively impact the spleen. But after getting this 12-week online yoga course, patients felt significant improvements in anxiety, depression, sleep, and fatigue. Overall, patients were very satisfied with this. Around 68% of patients said satisfied or very satisfied. And then 75% said it was helpful in coping with their disease. This led to a second study that uh, we got some updated analysis from just this last December at one of our large hematology conferences. Um, but, but of course, Dr. Mason knows these results very well. This was uh, compared an at-home yoga group to a wait list control. So people eventually got the yoga. It just They had to wait a little bit. And so they got that 12-week yoga course. Uh, and they also tracked, were tracked via Fitbit, and then we had them come in and actually give us some blood samples. And we did this remotely, where they actually would come in and uh, actually to a, a blo local blood center, and they would send the blood to us. But what we were able to see is actually in that blood analysis that this yoga intervention actually showed a significant decrease in one of the markers of inflammation that we saw. Um, there's ongoing studies in yoga and so they're, they're trying for a little bit more funding to, to push this to even a larger level and look at it in more depth. The second thing that we have going on is this active acceptance and commitment therapy. And it's been looked at in previous chronic conditions as well as in previous cancer, specifically in breast cancer and even in brain tumors. And so this actually is a process of helping people kind of cope with their disease and understand it. So acceptance, understanding their values, being present in the situation, knowing what actions to do, looking at self as a context, diffusion, which is a, a fancy term, and then overall looking at energy levels, and some patients actually can feel quite a bit better with this intervention. So they're gonna be doing um, basically a, another wait list study where some people will get the intervention right away, other people will get it a little bit later. But this is one of the things we have in the works as well as that larger yoga study. The third thing that's near and dear to my heart is actually nutrition. Now, if anyone saw me at lunch, do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that we've seen from other literature, because it really got me thinking about what we could do to try to impact inflammation, that we could be able to com basically pair with traditional therapies that wouldn't be, have any negative impacts. Now, we will, everything could potentially have a negative impact. Unfortunately, there's a side effect to almost anything. But nutrition seems like a pretty safe way to try to maybe control inflammation. So in looking at some of the, basically the studies that were done, especially in heart disease, we were able to see that patients who went on to a diet that was low in inflammatory, basically um, ingredients in foods, so things that prioritize fresh fruits and vegetables, especially green leafy vegetables, um, things that had low amounts of processed foods, fried foods, um, those sorts of diets actually caused patients to live longer. And that they actually, in looking at the blood, they saw reduced amounts of those in inflammatory markers or inflammation. Um, we also saw that actually some markers of blood clotting got better, so it makes you wonder if maybe we can even impact blood clotting. In some of the studies looking in highly inflammatory disorders, we, basically things that we think might be similar to the myeloproliferative neoplasms that have a lot of baseline inflammation, like inflammatory bowel disease, patients not only felt a lot better on the diets, but it actually again helped to control markers of inflammation in the blood. So this led us to the creation of the, what we call the nutrient trial. So there's multiple parts to this. Um, we completed uh, what we call part 1A and 1B, so essentially the first kind of just background finding information um, in March and April of last year. Um, that first part was basically an online survey asking people, especially MPM patients, about nutrition and different habits and preferences. And then that part B was looking at a focus group that we did uh, in Southern California, uh, which because it was a little easier down there. But so we basically just wanted to get a good, basically, uh, idea of what people were thinking regarding nutrition. 
So that large trial, I'm going to go through, or sorry, that large survey, I'm going to go through some of the results of that because it was actually, it looked very promising. So overall, we had 1,300 um, participants in that. And I, again, I thank you if you were a part of that. I was hopefully a lot shorter than some of the previous surveys that we've done. Um, we usually see a more females respond to online surveys. It's just something that we see. Um, we saw, um, we basically promoted the survey on multiple websites and web pages. So it definitely speaks to hopefully being involved even online with the MPN community because this is a great way for you to be able to connect with us. We had a whole bunch of different people actually respond from around the world. Most people were from the US or Canada. We had some from England and Australia, and then less so in non-English speaking countries, especially because we only put this out in English. But overall, 37 countries were involved. We were asked, first asked patients about if they changed their diet at all, and we actually saw a pretty high prevalence of people who said that they either had a food allergy or intolerance or had some sort of dietary restriction. The major thing that we got out of that, though, is that 34% of patients said that they were using their diet already to help control their symptoms or their myeloproliferative disease. And this is, comes in context of most of these people, um, I didn't put this in there, but most of them are not going to a nutritionist. This is people that are changing their diet on their own um, because it makes them feel better, because they feel that their blood counts are better controlled if they, if they don't eat you know, the donut every morning. So that's very significant and something that we should, we definitely need to look at. The other thing we did was we actually asked patients about what food they were taking in. And we looked at their symptom burden in this survey. What we were able to see is that patients who took in foods that are considered to be more, basically more inflammatory, so fried foods, fast foods, um, sodas with sugar in it, pre-processed foods, actually had, was correlated with significantly worsened symptom burden. But people who took in um, some foods that actually, uh, actually felt better, things like alcohol, some pasta use, um, and we're still trying to figure out exactly what would be the best diet to implement, but it does look like a Mediterranean diet might be very helpful, or even a traditional anti-inflammatory diet that's been used in other high inflammatory disease states. We also asked about supplement use, and 72% of patients were using over-the-counter supplements. Um, if the people used them, they were more likely to be older, be a little bit lower body weight, um, and have a little bit higher activity levels. In asking them specifically about what, sup what uh, supplements they used, as well as their symptom burden, we saw that patients who took in amino acids or another supplement called N-acetylcysteine, or NAC, was correlated with significantly improved symptom burden. And this was kind of interesting because a couple years ago, there was uh, people had looked in mouse models and saw that when they gave these mouse models of, M of MPN, so basically they were able to actually put a mutation into a mouse that was similar to what we see in humans, they actually saw that some of the blood, blood markers got better, uh, the spleen size decreased a bit, um, it, some of the, the actual uh, JAK2 um, the amount of JAK2 in the blood went down, and they saw some reduced uh, DNA damage. So it makes us really think that there might be a role for implementing different uh, non-pharmacologic interventions in MPN patients. Now, the thing I don't want anyone to do today is go out and say, well, Dr. Sherver said I, I need to eat this diet or I need to go take this supplement. I mean, the reality is that I, I can't recommend anything based on these results. It's just what this does show is that it's promising, but it, I haven't shown that it's safe or even feasible to, to make these changes. So that's our next steps. And so those, all of these trials are things that we're gonna be working on further here in San Antonio. And uh, it's gonna take a little bit of time, so bear with us, but we're very excited about the opportunities um, to really find alternative methods to be able to pair with traditional therapies. Um, the other thing was we, in this large survey, we asked patients about um, whether or not they'd be willing to even implement a diet, and around 96% of patients were willing to implement it if it helped to control their symptom burden, 98% if it would help even stabilize or reduce the risk of their MPN getting worse. Now, those are things we don't know if they would happen, but at least it shows that people are interested. We did those um, 
focus groups, and we were able to show again that everyone seemed very interested in a dietary intervention. Um, pretty similar to what we had seen before, a lot of times people are trying to use food to help control a disease. Um, they want, people want to connect with us and uh, connect with each other. Um, people were concerned about the lack of resources and that overall, again, a tailored dietary intervention might be very useful. So that's what we're going to be working on next, uh, as, as, along with all these other non-pharmacologic things. So that brings us to the big question, well, how do I become a part of this? Um, one of the, so there's, there's three different things I'm going to mention um, and, and different parts. Um, one of the things is the MPN Research Foundation has put together a mobile disease registry. And as we heard about earlier in the day, Although some people don't exactly think it's quite this rare, it, MPNs in many regards are considered a rare blood cancer and blood disorder. So in that regard, being able to put people together and actually be able to have people's information in one spot and actually track them over time is in, incredibly important. And so the MPN Research Foundation has actually created a registry where you can go online and actually choose how much information you want to be released. If you're the only one you ever want to see any of your information, this is more just information gathering for you, that's fine, and you can actually put that in your preferences and no one else will get your information. But if you want to be able to share that information, especially with us as researchers, or even have us as researchers be able to reach out to you if we think that there's a clinical trial that might be relevant for you, you can actually put your, that, your settings onto that to be notified. Right now, we track um, not only symptom burden, you can track it over time, but you can, we track a lot of the different disease features, and then when something new develops with your MPN, we actually have places that you can track it. So if you get a new bone marrow biopsy, if you have a new phlebotomy, if you get hospitalized for some reason, either related to your MPN or not, we have the ability of putting all that information into this registry. And so over time, we also have hopes to uh, develop this even further. So if we see that maybe you have really bad fatigue and there's something we really want to ask you about it, or if there's something more that we think we can do, hopefully reach out to, to people that that would be applicable for and actually um, intervene. The second thing I'm going to mention is something called InfoScript. And this is put out by the Leukemia and Lymphoma uh, Society. And it's actually a way that on your cell phone, you can text them and get information regarding your disease. Um, so specifically, you text that special number 411321, and you can text them with different keywords, and then they will ask you for an email, and then you, when you put your email in, you'll get more information back. And I played around with this a bit. It was very helpful. Um, they have options for newly diagnosed patients, caregivers, patients and caregivers. Um, just how to manage symptoms related to the disease, and then how to connect and get support. Finally, we actually, uh, specific to our group, which we call the MPN Quality of Life Study Group uh, that Dr. Mesa has put together, we have a quarterly report that we put out, not only with updates on um, some of the results of our research, but also with where we'll be putting together clinical trials and who will be opening them and how to get involved. So this is another way to kind of connect with us. I'd like to thank all of you and open it up to any questions. <laughs>